Hello everyone. Over the last few months I've been on this kick about phosphors and glowy stuff. I received two emails, one from my good friend Ken and another from Owen, suggesting that I take a look at infrared and thermal quenching of phosphors. Thanks for the great pointer, guys. At first I thought it was going to be an easy phenomenon to explain. I should have known, anytime you think something's easy, that's the thing that's going to come back and bite you. In the video I'm demonstrating infrared quenching. On the CD I've sprayed a thick layer of glow-in-the-dark phosphors. I'm exciting the phosphors with a violet laser, and then I'm using an infrared laser to do the quenching. I also need to point out that my camera can see in the infrared range, that's why the IR laser looks purple. After researching this quite a bit, I found that there are several theories of why this is happening, but the most common one seems to be that the luminance center is excited in producing more holes in the crystal lattice for recombination. If you'd like to learn more about phosphors and luminance centers, follow this link to some of my other videos. There are practical applications for infrared quenching. I made this little handy infrared tester out of a LED keychain and a piece of plastic with glow powder on it. It's great because you can test IR interrupters in very confined spaces. Interrupters are made of at least one emitter and receiver. They detect the beam being broken between the two halves. They're often used in very harsh environments, so it's very common for them to break. You just briefly charge the glow powder, put it between the interrupter, and you can see a small circle where the IR has quenched the phosphor. The phosphor's properties can also be affected by temperature. This makes them very useful for remote temperature detection through fiber optics or painting a surface with phosphors and detecting the quenching. I've read about this process being used inside of wind tunnels and on the surface of pistons and internal combustion engines. It seems to be very flexible. In this diagram, I'm showing how someone might make a fiber optic temperature sensor. You'll have a source to excite the phosphor, probably not a light bulb, something that can be strobed instead, like a laser or an LED. A light shielded area at the end of the fiber where the phosphor is, and a detector to receive the returning light. So again, the phosphor is excited, and then it decays, and the photo detector measures the time of the decay. And the decay is determined by the temperature. So to demonstrate this, I'm going to harvest a cadmium sulfide cell out of a toy, which are getting harder and harder to come by because our bureaucrats think that they're poisonous. And don't tell them that LEDs have arsenic in them or we won't be able to use those. So in a CDS cell, it's made up of cadmium sulfide, a couple metal fingers that make contact on either side. And when light impinges on the cadmium sulfide between the fingers, it makes it conduct less or more, depending on the amount of light. So it's pretty much a photoresistor. Unlike phototransistors, CDS cells have a very broad spectrum of light that they can detect. To excite the phosphor, I'm going to modify a circuit I use for the OLED experiments. It's a 555 timer. I'm just going to change a couple of components and add an LED to it so it blinks. You really don't need the MOSFET transistor for the blinking LED part of the circuit, but it was already on the board, so I'm leaving it. And then for the detector, I'm going to use the cadmium sulfide, which is coated with the zinc sulfide glow powder, with a pull-down resistor to ground, and then my oscilloscope hooked up to the middle nodes so that we can see the resistance change. This is a close-up view of the CDS cell covered with the glow paint and the UV LED. You can replace the LED with the blue LED also, but it really needs to be towards the blue spectrum to excite the glow powder. Here I have the LED blinking once per second, and you can really see the absorption and the decay of the phosphor on the oscilloscope. If I chill the phosphor with canned air, we can see a change in the waveform, but it's very subtle. If I change the rate of the LED to be faster, we can see a more dramatic change in the DC offset of the entire system. For an accurate measure, the entire sensor assembly needs to be in a light, tight enclosure. This also works when you heat the phosphor also. I've tested a couple phosphors and not all of them can be IR quenched. This is strontium aluminate and it doesn't seem to have much effect. However, you can quench some electrically excited phosphors like this EL display. I know it looks like a very bright spot, but that's because the camera is seeing the IR. This technique has been used to make infrared image sensors. Well, thanks for watching my video about IR quenching. I think you should follow this link right here and go over and learn why everyone should be wearing tinfoil dunce caps. If you need to contact me, you can reach me at scorch.chips at gmail.com. I do design work. Um, I'm always open to su suggestions. Uh, I'd love to hear from you.